Welcome back to the show. Sandra and I are back for another great afternoon with you guys. Right now we have uh, John's back with us. How you doing today, John? Always a pleasure to be here. It's more magical here than Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to welcome um, our guest, John Spur from Inspired Life Mortgage. He's having a little bit of problems with his headset. Can you hear now? I know. I don't hear anything. Oh. I'm not even talking to you then. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully, we're in the same room. You can hear yeah. us, so I think we'll be all right. Good. Well, uh, first things first, you know, we always start when we see you mortgage rates. Tell us about them. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, rates have gone up. Um, they did not go up because of the Fed announcements. There's very little movement due to the Fed announcements. What we're seeing is something that's very typical for September. Uh, pretty much every September, as we move out of summer, go into fall, go into the holiday seasons, the large companies like Target, Costco, these big, massive companies, they issue what are called corporate bonds. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we use mortgage-backed securities or mortgage bonds um, to generate money for mortgage lending. Uh, corporate bonds generate money for these corporations to operate off of going into the busy holiday season. They basically go out and offer a higher rate of return on their corporate bonds to pull the money that they need. Mm -hmm. There's only so much money to go around right. unless we decide to keep printing it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so what ends up happening for the mortgage market to be able to still have the funds they need, rates have to go up to compete with those corporate bonds. Mm. And this is just something that happens every September. I mean, it's probably the most predictable thing that happens to mortgage rates. We <laughs> know they'll go up in September. Okay. Um, but How long does that increase typically last? A couple, two, three weeks. Okay. No. And then it'll settle back down and we should see a little uh, dip back in rates. But rates are still... In comparison to just the last 20 year, 30 year history of rates, rates are still phenomenal. Right. You know, still great. Is this a good time for someone to look at buying down that rate? Uh, I love always looking at buy downs as an option. Uh, but we have to, there's questions that I ask. How long are you going to be in the home? If you're only going to be home for a year, you're not going to get the benefit of buying the rate down. Hmm. If you're going to be in the home for five to seven years, it may make sense to buy the rate down. Uh, but a lot of it is the, what we call the recoup cost. So right. let's say it's going to cost you $2,000 to buy the rate down, and you're only going to save 15 bucks a month. Mm. Probably doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. because it's going to be a long time to recoup that $2,000. Right. Now it costs you $2,000 to buy the rate down, and you're going to save 80 bucks a month. I would probably say do that because now you're under two years to get your money back. So mm. really you need to look at each one individually and kind of see where that... Um, consumer is. I mean, I'm sure the credit score and price of the house, all of that would be part of that calculation. Absolutely. And you brought up credit score, which is something that we talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. Sometimes getting the borrower's credit score improved before we submit to underwriting increase, makes the rate lower than actually doing a buy down. Uh, because credit scores, uh, interest rates are based on credit score and they're done in buckets. As an example, one of the buckets is 680 to 700. If you have a 699 credit score, you're getting the rate that's in that 680 bucket. Mm. But raising your score one point could be as simple as paying one credit card off. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, we're in the 700 bucket. And what they call loan level pricing adjustments, it's a fancy term for we make your rate higher, that loan level, <laughs> adjust, loan level <laughs> pricing God. adjustment goes away once we get you over that 700 or it, gets, it goes down one or the other. So sometimes looking at credit is a better way to get the rate down as opposed to doing a rate buy down. I think that's why we always tell our clients that the first step really is to have a conversation with you because you're looking at the big picture where when we're shopping rates, we tend to focus on just the interest rate, not the APR, but just the interest rate. And people can get sidetracked a little bit just being too focused on that number and not looking at the big picture. Absolutely. And the one thing that I've learned in my 30 years in the mortgage industry is that rates go up and rates go down. We're reaching the top. We're getting there. Uh, it may be another six months. Uh, and then we're going to start this plateau in another six to 12 months. The rates will start coming back down. That's just what happens. It's that peak and valley. Um, so although rate is something that everybody talks about and I think a lot of people think that's the most important part of the transaction budgeting and figuring out that monthly payment that you can afford makes more sense for me and that's what we do is we look at what the budget can be and not necessarily focus on the rate 
you said something, and I'd like to ask a question about locking down the rate. And when someone locks down the rate, that's their rate for the, mor- for the mortgage. But if they get a different score between now and the time it goes to underwriting, can you change the rate? In some cases, yes. Okay. So okay. That if, if we lock in the rate and then we're able to improve a credit score, there are cases where we can go ahead and get that better rate. Okay. okay. Hmm. I just wasn't sure if that was possible or not. It is. I had no idea. You just continue to bring new information <laughs> yeah, to me. I thought once you, yeah. once you locked in the rate, I thought you were kind of stuck with it at that point. So what we're doing is we're, we're locking the rate sheet mm-hmm. for that day. So let's say, as an example, I have a file from your guys' office, not from you particularly, but another one of your agents, where we were originally going conventional, and then some things were discovered, and now we have to go FHA. Well, we locked her in as conventional. But we got to keep the rate sheet from that day and just switch her to FHA instead of locking it today's FHA rates, which are higher than they were three weeks ago. So mm-hmm. when you log in, you're not necessarily locking that specific rate in. You're locking in that day's rate sheet so that you can switch amongst the rates and products of that day. Mm-hmm. I feel like you're just such a, an advocate for every client that we send to you, always looking to to find the best scenario for them. So... It's funny you use the word advocate because Alex, who um, is the one that does all the work, I don't do the heavy lifting, she gets it done for me. Right. Uh, her title is client <coughs> advocate. We don't mm. call her a processor, we don't call her a closer or a funder, and she does all of those different parts of the transaction. She is the client advocate. Um, and that's really was one of the main reasons that I left all of the big lenders out there is as a loan officer, you're not trained to be an advocate. You're trained to, how can I get another loan out of them? I'm going to give them a high rate today, and in nine months, I'll refinance them, and in nine months, I'll refinance them. Nothing is ever taught to you to go advocate for your borrower and do what's in their best interest. Uh, so that was one of many reasons that I wanted to get out of working for the big banks and have my own company so that we can figure out what makes the most sense for each individual. Now, as an individual company, though, you carry a large variety of products. Oh gosh, yeah. We, I mean, not all to say this, but technically, I have over 200 lenders I can work with. I'm not signed up with all of them. We have 31 or 32 right now that we have contracts mm-hmm. with, but it just allows us to do so many more other products mm-hmm. than you know the banks of America or the Wells Fargo's of the world who have a very mm-hmm. small product, a mm-hmm. very small box to underwrite mm-hmm. in. Yeah, actually, I tell people if you know if they're a lot of times their instinct is to go to their bank, but we find that in our industry, especially when you're working with the bank, sometimes they can be very rigid in those boxes that they have to fill. And so there's just so much more flexibility and so many more options for buyers when they're working with someone like your company with um, Inspired Life Mortgage. Mortgage brokers, um, which is what I am, we just have a bigger uh, a sandbox to play in. Yeah. We, just have, we have more t- more tools and more opportunities to 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 work with people that are credit challenged or income challenged or any of those uh, oddball things that other companies just can't work with. Hmm. I love listening to you talk sometimes. It just amazes <laughs> me. Listen all day long, I know. <laughs> Keep listening, guys. We have more great content with uh, John Spur. He is the owner of Inspired Life Mortgage. We are happy to have you here with us on this wonderful Sunday afternoon. Turn to the I Am Real Estate Show, brought to you by Ray Smith and Sandra Johnson with Indy Realty. We are back on the air. We have John Spur here with Inspired Life Mortgage. Welcome back. Thank you. Can he you was, hear now? Oh, I nah. can hear. This is much better. <laughs> we were having some technical difficulties. So. Just John Spur, though, not the rest of us. Just right, you. just John. <laughs> this is the way we treat our guests <laughs> complete, on this show. Complete operator error. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're talking about some of um, some of the challenges that you run into when you're working with clients. Um, what are some, I guess we kind of have, I don't know if self-sabotage is a good word for it, or he's shaking his head uh, yes. Yeah. No, so. no, so, so self-inflicted pain in yeah. the mortgage industry happens a lot. Mm-hmm. So give us some uh, examples of what um, what kinds of things kind of 
add extra hurdles for you in the lending process? And, and the first thing is when we come across this, I don't think of it as somebody did something wrong intentionally or think of them as not knowing what they're doing. Mm. For the last 20 plus years, we haven't been taught in school about finances at all. Mm -hmm. And when you go in to buy a house as a first time home buyer, you just don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing that we run into is your assets for down payment and closing costs. Because you do have to have money for your down payment and you do have to pay your closing costs. They're all over the place. They're in a savings account here, they're in a checking account there, they're in a Robin Hood account over here. I have some Bitcoin over here. I, you know, I do have fifty thousand dollars, but it's in ten accounts at you know two hundred fifty dollars a time, mm. uh, and then they start moving it, and we have to track from what account it came from, what account it came from, what account it came from. When I can get into the process early on, two, three, four months out before we buy a home, we can say, hey, you know what? Let's get everything consolidated into one account. Mm -hmm. So we have two clean bank statements that don't have a million deposits and we have to figure out where each one of these came from. And the reason the lender wants to know where each of those deposits came from is they want to make sure you didn't borrow money mm -hmm. for your down payment and closing costs and take on an additional debt. And so every time you make a deposit, every time you transfer funds, we have to know where it came from during the process. So having your assets for closing organized, ready to go and in one location mm -hmm. makes the process significantly easier. Hmm. And I have a question, actually, in kind of the same vein, but maybe a tangent. Like, what you know, what do you think is the solution to that problem? Like you were saying, finance isn't really taught in school. I took an economics class my senior year that was lackluster at best. Like, you know, what can homeowners do to kind of be, in, or renters rather, be in the know to figure out the process of homeowners? Because I mean, quite honestly, when I first bought my house, and even this house, which is you know the second house that I've owned. I, there's a lot I didn't know, and I've learned a lot through you guys in that process. So, I mean, what what can a homeowner do to better prepare themselves and make themselves knowledgeable on what to expect expect through this process? There's a lot of resources out there. There's first time homebuyer classes. We occasionally put them on and tr teach them. Um, there's homebuyer counseling, but I still think the absolute best thing, at least my opinion, is find somebody like me or myself and start the process sooner than you think. If mm -hmm you want to be in a new home in February, I would say you need to start that process now. You mm -hmm. need to talk to your lender, talk to me, let's look at everything. There's going to be things I guarantee you I can clean up or your lender can clean up from credit to income to assets so that we can have a really nice pretty picture to put in front of that underwriter mm -hmm. and get you qualified to go buy that home. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to buy a home, I'm going to move in next next month. It just doesn't work that yeah. way. It is a three, four, or five month process from mm -hmm. the time you sit down with somebody and get the ball rolling to you actually have the keys in your hand. Yeah, which I'm waiting for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had an update for you today yeah. too, well, but good. we're uh, well, for yeah. listeners that have been with us, yeah. we've started this process it's been, what, about a month ago? Yeah, Maybe just a little over a month. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully next week the plan is that we'll be handing you keys. Oh, it's wild. <laughs> it's a dream. And yeah, I mean, and to kind of put another feather in the cap of, of John Spur, uh, you know, outside of what I am real estate and what Sandra and Ray have done for, for me, like, and, I, and I've talked about this story before on the show, but when I, when I, we first got in, in connection with him, we actually weren't expecting to buy a house till October, but like, like I was advised, I got with John a little early just to make sure that, you know, we had all of our, our ducks lined up and our, our poop in a group. And, um, John suggested things to us that I, I already checked off the list. And one of those being a VA loan. And, um, he really was a lifesaver on that. I mean, I mean, he, I think he's pretty much he's going to at least be on my Christmas card list every single year <laughs> because he saved me about twenty, thirty thousand dollars right up front that I didn't have any idea that that I could save. And even you know, even though me and my wife did have it, now we can use that money for other things in the house, and it's just such a blessing. Oh, uh, it was it's fun to do. The majority of the loans I do, and I think you guys realize this too, are for purchase transactions are VA loans. Um, hmm. I love working with veterans. I'm very good with VA transactions, and I understand mm -hmm. them very well, and that's why we're able to do what we did for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think right now, out of the 10 or 11 transactions I have going, they are all VA loans. Mm. But there may be one that isn't. Interesting. Um, and they're all purchases. And each one of them had their own little unique twist as a veteran that I had to do something to get it to where it's at. Mm -hmm. 
one thing. Do they listen to you when you're giving them advice? Do they take the time to write it down and then go and go ahead and take that plan and run forward? I will tell you right now, if when I tell a veteran you need to go do this to get a house, mm. I'm telling you it's done the next day, if not mm. in the next hour. Um, when I'm dealing with other borrowers, it's hit or miss. It could be a day or two. It could be three weeks later. I'm still asking mm. for the same thing. Yeah, now you see why I like working with veterans so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hey, you guys follow direction well. <laughs> so, very well. It's a fact. <laughs> yeah, and you had mentioned, John, mentioned um, John, that you had taken VA off the list, mm-hmm. but really someone told you to take that off the list, Yeah, uh, I, on my, I think on my own, I, I applied to see if I was eligible for the VA loan, and I either p- picked click the wrong box or fill the wrong information or talk to the wrong person they told me I wasn't eligible so when John asked if he could check I was like all right if you want to waste your time go ahead it's your time but he's like I feel like it'll be a, a good use of my time and, and he was absolutely correct And your situation was unique it's not as unique as some of the other ones I've come across but I come across it frequently and it was mm-hmm. nothing that you did wrong mm-hmm. your military service wasn't entered into the system correctly mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we got that Phoenix, I used the guy in Minneapolis that I know set up, up in Phoenix. And as soon as he fixed that for me, we had the certificate of eligibility. Mm. Yeah. And like no time. Yeah. yeah well, and what a change that makes. Yeah. You know, and, and I think the knowledge that you bring, John. I, I got to be careful. I'm talking to John and John. Yeah, here, right? here, 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 and y'all don't know which way. Am I looking to my left or am I looking to my right? You guys don't get to see that. Yeah. So, Jonathan Spur, um, <laughs> the knowledge that you have to know who to call. And to take that next step, that really just comes from years of being in the industry. I mean, I'm, I'm an industry expert. I mean, I think once you've done something for 30 years mm-hmm. as a career, you earn the right to call yourself an expert. Yes. And that's, that's what I am. It's 15 years according to the court. So you've got twice that. Uh, so yeah. I'm, 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 <laughs> se- I'm a senior citizen yeah, expert. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just call it a high level expert. <laughs> How's yeah. that? Um, tell us how people can get a hold of you. Uh, best ways to reach out to me on my cell phone at 520-247-3610. He said again. 520-247-3610. Or I can be reached via email, John, J-O-N, at... Turn to the I Am Real Estate Show, brought to you by Ray Smith and Sandra Johnson with Indy Realty. Welcome back to the show. We are here again to welcome one of our best guests and good friend of ours, Rigo RC from Rigo Pest Prevention. How you doing, Rigo? I'm doing fantastic, and I know for sure that all your guests are the best. <laughs> let's get that. Let's get good. that clear. They're, They're all, all good, the best. But it's hard to match Rigo. Come on, yeah. come on. No, it's great. To, it's great to be with you guys back in the house. Love it. How's business, man? We're hanging on for dear life. Uh, I told every employee just the other day: tell your family you'll see them on Christmas morning. Uh, you won't see them otherwise. You're going to oh, be busy. Wow. You know, mm. we're going to have these guys rolling. You know, the rains are done. And what happens is the desert just comes alive. In fact, have you seen those Catalina Mountains? Mm-hmm. It's so They're beautiful. They are amazing. It looks you know, like we're in Denver, Colorado or something. Right, yeah, exactly. Wild. Vibrant. Mm-hmm. Well, the insect world loves that. A lot to feed on, a lot of seeds, a lot of hiding places. There's moisture. And so the desert is screaming right now. Everything that crawls and flies is, uh, is definitely plaguing us. So we're busy. I like that, hearing that you guys are out there busy. Um, you, talk, you talk, said something about people need a health check 
Yeah, you know, we were talking earlier, and it's interesting. We we get our teeth cleaned maybe every six months if we're smart, and you know, on top of that, right, we get those uh, medical checks once a year, mm. and uh, you know, even the car, right, we get that in for that all important oil change. But people, you know, they don't look at that house as needing a health check, uh, particularly when it comes to termites. You know, that's always the big one, right? We don't want them damaging our our uh, biggest investment. Mm-hmm. But you've got a lot of other things go- that potentially can happen. You know, you've got rodent intrusion. We've got a desert that just has a tremendous <laughs> rodent population. Mm. And then you've got, uh, you know, nuisance insects that can just kind of populate and, and become a real burden as they uh, get too close for comfort. And then, of course, this time of year, like I said, the flying bugs. You've got window screens that are maybe not tight or doors that are not sealed well. And people are wondering why they're scratching and, you know, itching and mm-hmm. so forth. And, you know, the insects need the tiniest little opening to get in. And when they're in, they're in, right? So you and I give off, you know, carbon dioxide and, and we've got our, our blood and it has a scent to it. And the insects are attracted to us. And, man, we're just a, we're a buffet waiting <laughs> to happen. <laughs> That's what we are. Mm-hmm. So a health check on a home, very smart to do. You know, we always like to recommend best practices on how to keep the property clean, how to keep the immediate structure clear, mm-hmm. you know, seal things up. And so we just, we love always meeting folks and giving a nice health check. Yeah, as you mentioned in that, the thing that comes to mind, once those little flying creatures or little biters get into the house, like what type of products do you recommend for them to handle that? You know, uh, when you say product, it's always last. You know, I'm always going to take an approach of a mechanical approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, try to stop the intrusion. But if they're gotten in, uh, ultraviolet lights or or different type of lighting that actually have little glue boards in the back of the unit Mm. draws them to the light, they get caught and problem solved. You know, Mm -hmm. if we can can control problems in a mechanical way, uh, non-chemical way, sanitation... You know, just a vacuum. Do you know how powerful a vacuum is in the pest control world? People mm. don't even think of it. Mm. It's all non-chemical first. You know, products are always last. So, okay. And, and I, in fact, I wouldn't even take a moment to even go through it because let's see if we can solve it in any other way. Yeah, and that and and, and asking that question, that's what I was thinking. I, I was I was expecting you to kind of give us more kind of systematic answers to the problem rather yeah. than putting nasty chemicals that's right will, will that's make your, right your animal sick or whatever the case yeah. may be you know and yeah. as a professional you would think uh you know we have access to some really quality insecticide products and it is true commercial grade but as a professional what it really defines me as is somebody that intelligently thinks through the problem okay. right and use all kinds of resources with chemicals being last i feel that i'm a professional because of that approach okay. not just relying on commercial grade insecticides I was wondering when people who live in town, I guess people who live in rural areas, the people in town don't think they need that that termite inspection or things as, as often as the people in a rural area. Is that a perception or a myth? Uh, that they don't need it yeah. is a myth. Yeah, yeah, they do need it. So the interesting, the interesting thing about subterranean termites is if we were to just peel back the desert floor, all the asphalt, concrete walkways, pool decks, everything, no matter whether you're in the foothills or you're in the valley, it's all the same. It's dirt, right? Mm. The subterranean termites are everywhere, period. Okay. Now, as far as uh, insects are concerned, yeah, the, the further in town, you've got a lot of asphalt. You've got a lot of concrete. Less foliage, not as wild, right, as moving further away out into the, you know, the outer edges. You're going to have maybe a, a, a less pressure, as we call it, right? Less scorpions, less centipedes. But uh, as you go further out towards the edges of town, you get into the desert areas, you're definitely going to be plagued more with insect life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's true. But termite-wise, all over the place, every mm-hmm. square inch of this desert. Yep. Is there a time of the year that is best to have homes inspected? I mean... Yeah, it's a good question, actually. Uh, you know, overall, anytime. You know, once a year minimum, Right. When it comes to the termite side of the business, and I seem to be saying that a lot, Mm -hmm. certainly after these rains, you know, now that we're done, I always recommend to my customers two inspections a year. One after the monsoon rains, you're talking like, you know, October, November, December in there, right? So Mm -hmm. the fourth quarter. And then the other is after the winter rains, 
and after the, the winter thaw, if you would. Not much of a thaw here, mm. but uh, I would say the second quarter in the spring. So one in the spring after the winter rains and one in the uh, late fall, early winter after the uh, monsoon rains. Mm -hmm. That would be my recommendation there. But, you know, if you get one inspection a year, good health check, you're doing your house a service. Mm -hmm. yep. Are you seeing any particular type of pest that maybe is abnormally active right now, not just from the monsoons, but just... Now return to the I Am Real Estate Show, brought to you by Ray Smith and Sandra Johnson with Indy Realty. Welcome back to the show. You're with Ray Smith, Sandra Johnson, and John McClain. We have our awesome guest with Rigo Arce. How you doing, Rigo? I'm doing fantastic. Um, we talked during the break, and I thought I'd bring up something really quick for you. Fact or myth? Water puddles, reading grounds for mosquitoes. This is a great show. I feel like I'm on a game show. <laughs> <laughs> what do I win, well, Sandra? I get, if I get this right, what do I win? I want to know. Um, oh boy, Fact or I'm myth. looking around. I don't know yeah. what I don't know what the prize is. It yeah. might it you might be my co co-host yeah. here. <laughs> you, want, you want a half drink water bottle? <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, listen. Fact or myth with the puddle? The answer is both. It's fact and myth. Um, here's the fact. Yes. Standing water does breed mosquitoes, but it breeds a specific species. Some mosquitoes need standing water to lay their eggs, and then the larva, right before they become an adult mosquito, that larva bobs up and down inside that water, and they feed on debris, and, and that's mm. how they grow. Mm -hmm. But we have another species of mosquito here, and they don't need standing water, and that's where the myth comes in, and that's where the danger comes in. When you ha just think of a uh, your your black your your block wall, you've got this wall, and there's all oleander bushes lined up against it. Looks gorgeous, right? And all those leaves over time they fall and they just decay, and it's dark and shadowy there and moist. Underneath those leaves, that's breeding site. Mm. Just a tiny bit of dampness, soil, and there you go. You've got a breeding site. So you don't need standing water. Both will breed, and and we and again two different species. So when you're looking at you know best practices, you want to trim those oleanders from the ground up, get it nice and clear. See, kind of see that trunk, uh -huh. rake it all out. If sunshine can shine all in there and keep it nice and dry, you're good to go. You're going to eliminate a breeding site right there. Hmm. When someone calls you, do you go through their property and if you see something like that, you mention that to them as part of your report when they're talking with you guys? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's certainly what we train to. And mm -hmm. I think like any company, you're always uh, educating your team to be that way, to mm -hmm. be that professional. The, the answer is yes, that's my hope. And, uh, I, you know, 33 years for me, it comes naturally. I, in fact, it's it's annoying with people I hang out with because we're talking about, you know, U of A football and I'm, go and I'm looking at a termite tube, <laughs> or, you know, or, <laughs> or, hey, look at that, you know, and I'm pointing things out and, and maybe even picking the darn thing up. But, uh, you know, the bottom line is, is, you know, with my years of experience, it's very natural for me to talk to people as I'm walking their property. The answer is yes. We want to be that resource for people. And I keep training my guys, scan, 
keep scanning, look, suggest, make recommendations. Are there other things that um, that we should be doing as homeowners to kind of um, protect that barrier, I guess, around the house? Uh, you know, big thing, I think I've said it on this program before, is just avoid clutter. I think mm -hmm. clutter is one of those big ones. You know, people, you know, we don't have a lot of storage with these homes. Right. Uh, especially if you're from California, you're from the, the, the Northwest or the East Coast like I am. You know, you had basements, you had you had closets galore, you, you know, you had square footage. And here, we don't have a whole lot of storage. And so what people do is they just line up alongside of the house or in the garage, mm -hmm. just everything they own, you know, and stack it. I say keep clutter free. You mm -hmm. know, keep it simple. You know, you want to keep things keep away. Keep clutter free. That's it. Keep, keep clutter, clutter free. free. That's <laughs> it. Let's, let's do that. That's, that's right. That's our mantra. So, uh, okay. That's, that's probably the big one. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I pulled a <laughs> ray on you. <laughs> I think you owed him that from yeah. last week. <laughs> nice. Nice. When it comes to your business, you, ha you do inspections and you do services. Yeah. Which one is taking most of, most of your time right now? Uh, you know, it's, uh, I would say services right now. I mean, it's, it's really both, right? But uh, in services, because we already have an existing base of customers. By the way, loyal customers. And if I may, if any of you are a customer out there, I want to personally thank you for choosing Rego Pest. We actually look at that as a tremendous honor. In fact, I'm, I'm going to segue here super quick and just say I'm so darn proud. We were named Tucson's number one pest control company through the Reader's Choice four nice. years in a row. Yay. Congratulations. And, uh, it's super yeah. humbling. And, you know, listen, it's our customers that did that. Uh, but, yeah, we're, we're busy with service, but we are doing a lot of inspections. We offer free inspections. I was surprised. I heard that there are companies that charge for inspections, mm -hmm. you know. Now, that's not to be confused with the real estate inspection if you need that all-important state report right. for your escrow. That's different. That there's a small fee for that. But if someone calls and they just need a sanity check or that health check or I hear a thump in the night, can you check it out? Hey, that's free. And we're excited to do that. You know, those inspections are free. We just want to make friends with people, introduce ourselves. And at the end of the day, we just want to be a resource. I, my, one of my favorite calls, if I may, I love hearing from somebody like a year later and they said, I met you a year ago, and you inspected my home, and everything was fine. Hmm. You made a couple of recommendations, but everything was fine. But now a year later, they need me, and they hmm. didn't forget me. Hmm. That is a big score. That just warms my heart. I mean, hmm. uh, that's huge. Yeah, Love it. We need you, Rigo. <laughs> 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 I have not scheduled, put it on the calendar yet, but we definitely are going to get got that you service started. We got you yeah. covered. Yep. Um, you had someone come out and take a look at the house and make some recommendations for us. Really strange thing going on at our property is mm. that we have pavers, and mm. we're starting to see all these piles of rocks that are being undermined underneath mm -hmm. the pavers. And yeah. mm. so I, I don't even know what to do with that, you right. know, because you... you it it just kind of creeps up on you. It's a little pile, and the next time you look, you've got this mound of dirt, sure. and your pavers are all of a sudden sinking. Yeah, you know. So. Yeah, I was joking with a customer about that once. I said, well, when I go to San Diego, I want to dig my feet into some soft sand, you know, and enjoy the rays, mm -hmm. right? Not to be confused with this ray. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> what I don't want to do is go to the beach and have, you know, hard pan soil or, you know, like, Caliche or something. I mean, I'm not going to enjoy that. Right. Pavers, uh, they offer a really nice environment, right? That sand is real soft underneath. It's been padded down. And insects, whether it's lizards, ants, field mice, uh, you know, even, even roaches for that matter. We have a burrowing roach here. They love that sand. It's easy to work, smooth. It's a good place. Yeah. Uh. Mm. So lucky you. It's like as, as you were saying <laughs> that, it, it was almost as if you you think like like a rodent. Man. It, it was just like it was just like you were just you, dreaming of being that rodent, that burrowing you, in that sand under those pavers. Yes, you got to. In fact, it's funny you said that, John, because I tell my guys you got to think like a bug. Yeah. You know, you do. Where if I was a bug, where would I hide? And uh, when you think like that, you you end up kind of finding their their little lurking little, places. Little hiding yeah. places. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's been a while since we had Rico, Rico here, and I want to remind him and remind everyone else that first time you were here, we mentioned the fact that you had people come to a couple of our inspections, mm. and they are a 100% exact replica of you. Aww. They have the same attitude, the same care, the same everything. And as I talk to them, I sit there and tell them each of them, and you guys are lucky to have you as an owner. And everyone tells me, 
no, we're lucky. We're lucky to have him. Oh, He's not lucky cool. to have us. And so mm. I'm, I'm very proud every time I see one of those guys and they, they feel that much about us. You do such a great job. Wow, that's great and to And I hear. want to tell everybody on the air that um, we really appreciate what you do well, thank and what you. your company does Man, that here means in Tucson. A lot. Yeah, that means a lot. We're pretty picky, to be honest. and uh, But we love our people. Uh, we build into our people. In fact, that's where, if you want to know where our service comes from, it starts loving on them. You know, we take good care of them. That word family is kind of thrown around a lot. I, I came from a culture of, you know, family with a company I used to work for. And it was real back then. Mm. Uh, you know, my, my first 18 years in this business, I, was, I felt like a, a part of a family. And it changed over the years. But uh, at Rego Pest, that, that's huge. You know, we build into our people. And from there, they go out and then they represent, you know. Can I say that the word you used was the exact words that you, um, your um, one of your agents used. He said it was a loving community. The exact oh. same word you just used wow. just now. That's so that's cool. let you let you know that it resonates outside of your office. Right on. People bring it out to to the clients and to my clients who sees that and realize that's big. That they got a great company. Thanks, Ray. For. That means mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, and I, I I also want to mention just like just driving around and then granted like seeing your trucks is kind of like when you buy a car. You see that car everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, like if you know someone. F- who wasn't from Tucson didn't know any better they definitely would put you up there with those guys with the cars with the oh, ears with big. the mouse ears on yeah, it cuz yeah, i mean you, you definitely you've built a very legitimate a very sound very beautiful product thank you and i'm i'm really you know happy that we were able to align ourselves with thanks, you cuz it's, it's thanks. a really impressive appreciate thing that, that you're yeah doing. we've kept it clean colorful and uh, simple you know nothing too wild but uh, thank you appreciate and raymond that. said we you've done a couple for us you do all of our hey. termite inspections <laughs> so mm-hmm. I'm, they did did on my house right <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. Total oh yeah honor. Mm-hmm. if it has if it has to do with sandra and i it was a rego inspection right, <laughs> right, on, right <laughs> on yeah in fact i think i owe you guys i need to be at one it's been a little while yeah you haven't seen everybody I was, I was yes. expecting to see you at the inspection yeah. of my house. Yeah. 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 all right <laughs> i gotta get that done 